Well, let me say it's really nice to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, as a family, we've had links uh, with the TAB over many years. Uh, members of our family who are part of the church family here. And also, of course, as already been mentioned, Anne Christian, who uh, worships with us in Ipswich. Uh, she is very clear in her mind that, uh, that the tabernacle here is her home church, her sending church. She's fiercely loyal to all you good folks here in Worthing. But we count it a real privilege to have Anne as part of our fam a church family, part of our congregation, and along with you and others to share in supporting her as she works for Christ and seeking to bring the good news of Jesus to uh, Southeast Asia, that part of our world, a very needy part of our world. So it's really great to be with you this morning. Uh, thank you for your invitation and thank you for the chance to be with you throughout today. I want to talk very simply this morning just about hands. Everyone's got them, or most of us have here this morning. We've all got hands. We're very fortunate. 26 bones or thereabouts that very often we can so easily take for granted, and yet they are so important and so useful to us. They say, don't they, that every picture tells a story. And if you look at that picture up there on the screen, it's not a photoshopped picture. It's not a picture that was particularly posed for. But it shows two young people who clearly think uh, a lot of each other. She's prepared her nails beautifully. Uh, their hands are clean, very presentable. And yet, if you look carefully, and perhaps it might not come out quite on the image there, if you look carefully, particularly at the man's hand, although he's someone who works in an office, you will see that there's a blister in the palm of his hand and also a blister near his index finger and middle finger. I wonder what he'd been doing. And here they are. This is their wedding weekend. Uh, we were fortunate to be at their wedding. And uh, why did they take a picture? Not because I was coming to Worthing Tabernacle, but because this groom one, went one step forward. Not did they only join in hands, but they exchanged ring. I give you this ring as a sign of my love to you. But he went one step further than any other groom I've ever come across so far. And he made the rings. It's amazing what you can learn from YouTube, isn't it? <laughs> he bought the gold. He bought a rolling machine. He uh, fashioned the gold. He shaped it. He uh, polished it. And when it came to the day of their wedding, he gave these rings. So these hands that uh, there, they're so presentable, um, they're the joining of hands, um, there's these rings that have been given, and the rings were actually made. How were they made? They were made through the skill and the use of his hands. I think I'm thinking about hands this morning because you just had your, your craft autumn craft fair over the last couple of days and I was sort of thinking about you know how can I say something that will at least have some sort of connection with what you were doing over the last few days and uh, you've had tremendous skills and projects and hobbies and opportunities displayed and taught over the last couple of days here in this building and all of those things or many of those things they demonstrate that the skill and the discipline and the ability that people have to do the most amazing things with their hands. Of course, we understand that some people who don't have the use of their limbs, they can do great things with their feet and with their mouths, painting and such like. But generally speaking, something that we so often take for granted, we can do amazing things with. And of course, hands can tell us a number of things about people. A fingerprint tells us about uh, individuality. Our car got stolen once. I was then invited to collect it from the police station, which I was very happy to do. And it was all covered in this sort of silvery grey powder. Why did they do that? Why didn't they tidy it up, I was asking myself. <laughs> and of course, they were looking for fingerprints to try and apprehend the people who borrowed our car to break into a hospital to raid the drugstore. Hands can tell you a lot about people. Sometimes people have beautiful little long slender fingers like uh, this lady here. Other times people have short stubby hands or big shovels and sometimes an indication of sort of things that they do. 
Sometimes it says something about a person's character. You get a really warm, enthusiastic handshake, and other times you get a kind of bit of a limp, wet fish type experience. You know the sort of thing? The church that I grew up in, there was a butcher. And he had sort of sausages for fingers. <laughs> and when he shook your hand on a Sunday, you tried to put your hand in and then just extract it a little bit because you felt he was grasping the meat cleaver. <laughs> and it could be quite agonizing to experience a Tom McClement handshake. Hands tell us all sorts of things. Speak about attachments, whether someone is married or single sometimes. Not always, but it sometimes does that. When I was a boy at school and the nurse used to come in and she went through her routine, one of the things she always looked at was her nails. I, I wasn't really sure why she ever did that, but uh, I guess it showed her something really important. And uh, nails can tell us something about our health as well. Lots of things that hands can speak to us about. And so I want to think about hands this morning. Hands that create and produce. Psalm 19 and verse 1, it says, that the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the works of his hands. It goes on, that psalm, slightly changing the picture, but sticking to the same idea. It says, day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. The heavens display, declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. I mean, the fancy word for that is anthropomorphism. We're not actually saying that God who inhabits the universe physically has hands like you and I have. But in order to help us appreciate and understand something of the way in which God works, when we see the skies, we sort of say, well, you know, God has done that. And so we say that's his handiwork. And we think of him like that. God doesn't have physical ears like we have. He doesn't have physical eyes like we have. But in order to help us appreciate something of who he is and what he is able to do, we, we attribute those things to him to help us understand. And God doesn't have a physical hand, but nonetheless the skies speak to us of the nature of God, the splendor of God, the power of God, the creativity of God, the goodness of God. Of God, And when we go out and we see the skies and we see the heavens and we marvel at them, we're saying that's the handiwork of God. God has done that. And so we lift our eyes and we look to the heavens. And as Isaiah asks the question, he says, who created all these? And he says, because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. What's what we see with our eyes speaks to us of the skill and the power and the ability of the creator. I don't know what amazing things you had displayed here in this building yesterday, but I'm sure some of those things, when you saw them, you went, how did you do that? That's just amazing. Isn't that, isn't that clever? And as you looked at the object and you admired that, the thought process surely moves on and it thinks, what about the person who did that? Aren't you clever? Were you really able to? How did you go about and do that? And as we look at the world and as we look at the universe and all that God has given to us, we're invited not just to look at the gifts, but to look beyond and to think of the giver. What a tragedy it would be to go through life, wouldn't it, and receive all God's good gifts and never to look beyond and come and say thank you to the giver. What a sad thing that would be, wouldn't it, to, to happily receive everything that God gives for us that so sadly we can take so easily for granted and yet not to come and thank him and have a 
have an encounter with him, to know him for ourselves. You know, the things that God has made speaks to us of not only what he's able to do, but it speaks to us of him. And it's an invitation to come to him and to thank him and acknowledge him and to know him more fully in our lives. So you'll find about 120 verses in the Bible that that speaks about the hand of God. Isaiah 66 says this, For my hand made all these things, and so they came into being. But unlike us, when we go to make something, uh, God started with nothing. You know, whenever we cook a meal or we um, make something, it might be a craft thing or it might be something we want to do around the house, um, one of the things we need to do before we go very far is we need to collect in our minds and perhaps make a list of the, of the things, the basic materials that we need in order to see this project through. So we'll end up with a shopping list or we'll go down the shed or into the garage and we'll have a hunt through of those little boxes where we keep all those things that we keep just for that occasion. <laughs> but not so with God. This is amazing, it's astounding. God started with no material. He just made it. You always start with something. You might deconstruct something and make something new out of it. You might be creating something new for the first time. But you have to go and get those basic materials. But the God that this Bible speaks of, the one true and living God, he started with nothing except himself and he spoke he spoke and it came to be it's phenomenal absolutely phenomenal we sometimes forget don't we this is the god from whom our lives and everything else comes The God who creates, the God who through his handiwork displays to us something of his nature. The God who started with nothing. And from all of that, all that we know and understand comes. It's astonishing. I heard a story a a long time ago and... um, I was so sort of intrigued by it, thinking again about it this morning, that I went off hunting for it, and I actually managed to chase it down and find it. It was about, it was about a couple of Russian sculptures. This dates from the time when Russia was a, a rigidly communist country. It was vehemently atheistic, um, Educationally, people have been taught that there is no God, that the things that you see round about you, um, they've just always been here. There is no God. God does not exist. And yet, this couple, they shared something about something that happened to them. They said, once we worked on a statue of Stalin. During the work, my wife asked me, how about the thumb? Just stick with this, all right? Stay with me. To do with hands and God. How about the thumb? If we did not have an opposing thumb, if our fingers were like our toes, where we don't, you know, our toes all stick out in the same direction. If our fingers were all like our toes on our feet, we could not hold a hammer, a mallet, a tool, a book, or a piece of bread. Human life would not be possible without this little thumb. Now, who made the thumb? You can just picture it, can't you? They're, they're working away, and, and this thought comes into our mind. If we didn't have the thumb, how could we do what we do? How, how would life be for us if we didn't have the thumb? And they went on in their thinking. Marxism teaches that heaven and earth exist by themselves. But if God did not create heaven and earth, if he only created the thumb, he'd be praiseworthy for that little thing. 
And they went on in their thinking, where they began to, in their minds, attribute kind of thanks and praise to not just the maker of the thumb, but other things in life that began to sort of impress themselves upon them. Beauty and children. And although they knew that it was not right in their culture to speak about God, they talked about the God who created the thumb. Do you remember Paul turned up in a place called Athens once where there was an idol to an unknown God? And in a sense, these people began to appreciate something that they didn't really know, but through the thumb, they began to think in terms of someone who was completely otherly from themselves who was worthy of praise. And just as Paul came into Athens and said to them, what you worship is something unknown, I am going to explain to you. So somebody called Richard Vermbrandt, some of you will know that name, he came across this couple and they told them about their experience. And he took them further on in their thinking and understanding and introduced them to the God who is the creator, the God who is living, the God who is coming, who has come in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The amazing handiwork of God. Do you need to, in the words of a sentence in 1 Peter, humble yourself under God's mighty hand in order that he will lift you up? Do we just assume that all that we have is just what we have created Do we just assume that we can go on in a haughty way and just keep receiving these gifts and bypass the one who's given to us? Or do we need to humble ourselves under his mighty hand so that he will lift us up? It's been said that God gives us creation and his word as different lenses to see the same truths about him. So we come to the passage that uh, we read uh, earlier in the service where Jesus, who is God, he is in our world. He has given himself up to death on the cross. And here he is, John tells us in John chapter 20. He's alive again. He's appearing to his disciples just as he said he would. And here is God in human form, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has a body just like ours. He has hands. He is physically here and he has hands like yours and mine. And Jesus makes a point when he comes to his disciples on the first Easter evening, which is the first part of the passage we read, and then a week later when he appears to Thomas, he makes a particular point of showing his hands and his wounds to them. He does so quite deliberately because he wants there to be absolutely no misunderstanding about what has happened here. He had told them that they would have to go by Jerusalem where he would be taken and he would be put to death and how three days later he would rise again from the dead. Jesus had told them these things. They'd kind of half forgotten it sometimes. They hadn't really grasped it. They got a bit confused by some of the things that had happened. But here it was. This was reality. This is what was happening. And so there was absolutely no misunderstanding about what happened. Jesus stands among them And as part of that, he shows them clearly who he is. And as part of that, he shows them his hands. And as we think about that, I just want to to think that through a little bit further and perhaps suggest to you some of the things that the hands of Jesus quite legitimately speak to us about. As the disciples saw those hands, they will have seen marks, terrible marks, But as they saw the hands of Jesus, they will have seen these hands that they had been in the presence of that person for over three years. And what had they seen? What had they come to learn through their time with Jesus and the things that he had done? And I'd like to suggest that the first thing that those hands speak to us about, very simply, is that they're saving hands. Saving hands. 
After Jesus had presented what's called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7, you go straight into chapter 8, wallop, what happens? He meets a man who's got leprosy. Leprosy was a, a terrible disease, a terrible illness. It meant that you were ostracized from society. It was a, a lonely life unless you found other people in the same situation. There was no cure. It was, it was a terrible condition to experience. And this leper comes to the Lord Jesus. And he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And we're told that Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. And he was cured. And Jesus told him to go and show himself to the priest to make sure that that was verified so that he could be reintegrated again back into the community to be with his family to take up his occupation again quite literally he got his life back through the touch of the Lord Jesus Christ the transforming power of Jesus Christ just by reaching out and placing his hand on this person this person's life was completely changed he was transformed but of course here in John 20 The disciples will have seen that the horrible damage of Christ's recent death on the cross, scarred by the nail marks. It was something that Jesus had told the disciples on numerous occasions would happen. And it was part of his mission and purpose of coming into the world. Before he was born, the angel of the Lord comes to Joseph and he says to Joseph, who was very taken aback by this, not only by the presence of, uh, of the Lord coming, but the message, uh, Mary's going to have a son, and here we go, you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And so at the proper time later on, we find that Jesus is nailed on a cross. John the Baptist, when he'd said, seen him, he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the purpose of Christ's coming was that he would deal with the sin that separates you and I from God by ourselves. We can't break our way through that. It's something which is too big for us to deal with. God amazingly has come into this world in the person of his son, Jesus, in order to do something for us that we can never do for ourselves. And that is to remove the barrier of sin that separates us from knowing God in a personal and in a direct way. And so the Lamb of God is led like a lamb to the slaughter. He's pierced for our transgressions. He's crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brings us peace is upon him. And there's the hands... And by his wounds, we are healed. And the disciples, they see this. And how much at this actual moment they understood, I'm not really sure. But between the time of Jesus' resurrection and his ascension, they went on a sort of intense Bible training course, and they certainly got the picture by the time Jesus went to heaven. That here through the cross... And through the stretching out of his arms, salvation comes. There's a story uh, told, a story told about a mother who had the most terribly scarred hands. In fact, it was so scarred that she would often wear gloves in order for people not to see that. And, and one day, her, her daughter, she, she saw these hands and she said, Mommy, your hands are horrible. Later that day, when her father came home, and I, I guess perhaps her mum had a word with her dad, her dad came to his daughter and said, When you were a little baby, there was a fire. And where you were, you were cut off by the fire. 
and your mum, in order to save you, she, she went through the fire and she snatched you and she, she took you to safety. But in doing that, she got badly burnt. And that's why your mum's hands are like they are. And the story goes on that having heard that, the little girl, she goes back to her mum and she says, Mum, can I see the most beautiful hands in all the world? The hymn that says something like this, by and by, as I look at his face, beautiful face, scarred face. It goes on, it says, by and by, as I look at his hands, beautiful hands, I'll wish I had given him more. And the hands of Jesus, they speak to us of the saving work of Jesus. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and part of that meant, by, meant going by the cross. People who are on the wrong side of God, their situation can be completely transformed because of what Christ has done if they come and take to themselves what Jesus has done for them. So saving hands. The second thing that the hands of Jesus speak to us it says very simply, as they looked at them, they will have seen strong hands. Jesus was no wimp. Uh, we understand that he was a, a carpenter. He was involved in the sort of building trade. Back in those days, the wood wasn't delivered on the back of a truck. You would go out and you'd actually select the tree that you want. You would fell it. You would be responsible for transporting it back to your workshop. There were no power tools in those days, no special offers in Lidl. You know, you had to work by the sweat of your brow. Jesus was someone who was used to doing hard physical work, felling the tree, preparing the timber, producing the final object. Jesus was someone who was a man's man. On another occasion, we know how the Lord Jesus, he was walking on the water. And Peter was, uh, after he got over the idea, he was very excited by this and he had the opportunity to get out of the boat and to go to where Jesus was. But we're told that when he reached Jesus, he was afraid of the wind. He saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink. And when he sank, what did he do? He shouted out, Lord, save me. And the gospel goes on and it tells us immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and he picked him up. The hands of Jesus, they speak to us about strength. The Lord is able to see us through every storm in life. As the good shepherd, he spoke of himself being the good shepherd. He is able to protect, he's able to guard, he's able to keep his sheep. Speaking in John 10, the Lord Jesus, he says this, I give my sheep eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. You might think to yourself, well, if I come to the Lord Jesus and he, he saves me, is he able actually to keep me? Is he able to hold me going forward? And Jesus says, as the good shepherd, no one can snatch them out of my hand. In fact, he gives a sort of copper-bottomed guarantee. He kind of gives a belt and braces job because he goes on and he says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of the father's hand. And so to come to the Lord Jesus means that we are secure, we are safe, we are held firm, we are in a strong place. No one can snatch them out of my hand. No one can snatch them out of my father's hands. I remember when I was a wee boy, I'd be sometimes out with my mum, uh, particularly if we're up in Glasgow or something, and there'd be times when I was very conscious. I mean, my mum was a bit like the Queen. She never went anywhere without a handbag. <laughs> Why somebody needs 27 objects? Is that the average in their handbag? I will never know. 
But I remember sometimes clearly being out with her and going along the street and then coming to a place where I was very conscious that she would tighten the grip on her bag. It would come up here and it would be held really tight because like everything that we ever possessed that was important was in that bag. <laughs> let me just say, you know, if someone goes for your handbag, whether you're a man or a woman, just let them take it. It's not worth it. It's not worth a broken hip, is it? But why did she do that? Well, because somehow she kind of had her senses up and she thought, this is a bit dodgy. I'll, I'll just hold on to this a bit tighter. She was kind of preparing herself in case something happened. But the thing about a snatch is it's sudden, isn't it? Sometimes it just happens. And Jesus says to us this morning that actually he's ready all the time. No one can snatch you out of his hands if you come to him and you know him. And finally, the hands of Jesus, they speak to us about skillful hands. I mean, as a carpenter, he did take that lumber. He did make it into something useful. I mean, the apocryphal stories that sometimes tend to be a bit fanciful, um, they used to tell stories how, you know, the, the yokes that Jesus made... No ox ever got a sore shoulder from a misfitting yoke that Jesus made. I mean, it's kind of just made up ideas, isn't it? But you can see where they get the thought from. You know, more, no, no, no ox had to have a, a, sure, a sore shoulder. Skillful hands. Jesus, he rides into Jerusalem. He rides on a colt never been ridden on before and yet he comes into Jerusalem in a majestic way unbroken and yet he comes in he shows his skill Israel's greatest king King David who reigned for over 50 years who was a flawed king at times unlike Jesus who was tempted in every way as we are and yet without sin but of David, it says of him in uh, Psalm 78, it says of him, and David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. And here's God, Jesus has come. And Jesus can be known today because he's the one who is alive, because he's the one who appeared to the disciples. This is no fairy tale. This is no fanciful idea. This is something that really happened. Why get involved in being a Christian if it's not true? What are we doing here this morning if it's not real? The evidence for Jesus' presence in this world and his resurrection is unquestionable. He comes and he stands amongst them. He shows himself to them. In many different ways, he attests to the fact that this thing really has happened. And he is the one who is skillful, the one we can trust. The disciples, they heard his teaching. They understood something of his wisdom. They saw the way he behaved towards people. And he's the one who comes to us and he invites us to entrust our lives to him. You know, this is a great church to preach in. Nobody told me how long I had this morning. Is it about time I finished? Is it? Yeah. In the bedroom I stayed in last night, there was a poster on the wall. It was a hand. It was hand drawn by my niece. And it just said, He's reaching out for you. Take his hand. Take his hand. I, I don't know who's here this morning. I'm a complete visitor. You know that. But the hands of Jesus, they speak to us of someone who gave his life in order that you might be saved, forgiven 
transformed, changed, brought into his family. Hands of Jesus, they're, they're strong hands. They're able to hold you and guide you and support you in every aspect of your life. Hands of Jesus are skillful. He is able to be with us and help us in every circumstance that we find ourselves in. I must just finish with this because somehow I just need to. Um, I talked about being in Glasgow with my mum. That was all right. But being in Glasgow with my dad, (laughs) that was better. Because I remember as a four and a five-year-old crossing roads. With my mum, it was stand at the edge till it's all clear and go. With my dad, a Guile Street, which is like Oxford Street in London. I'd be four or five years old. I don't know why on earth I was up there on my own with him at that age, but I used to be sometimes. And it would be, right, Andy, after this one, let's go. And my little hand would go up inside his big hand and we'd go halfway. And we'd be in the middle of a guile street with buses going this way, trucks going that way. And do you know what? It felt dangerous. I had a strong feeling that my mother would not approve. (laughs) But I loved it. And I felt so safe. And why was that? Because my little tiny hand was up inside his big hand. And I knew if my hand was in his hand and I was with him, it would all be okay. And so gladly... I'd put my little hand up into his big hand because I knew that to be with him was to be in the right place. And God has come. The God who we look out and we see his handiwork, he came. And his hands were so damaged. And he invites us to come and to entrust our lives, to put our hands into his and to walk with him. I've brought some books with me this morning. Uh, I guess you've got books here. It's just a wee book called The Unique Jesus. If you want to know more about Jesus and what it means to follow him, then um, I've got a dozen or so of these. And if you'd like to read that, to think more about what it means to follow Jesus, you'd be very welcome to take one of these. If you want to talk to something about the things we're doing here in this church and talking about, then talk to some of the team members here or myself. We're very glad to do that.